Hey everybody, in this video we are going to review for test number three, which is your final exam. Um, your final exam is going to be a multiple choice test. You're going to have a number of questions. Uh, you're going to answer the questions and at the end when you hit submit, you're going to see your score pretty much immediately on there. Um, the questions are going to come from modules one through nine. So it is a cumulative test. It covers all nine of the modules that we have covered so far in this class. And so honestly, going back over and looking the practice looking at the practice test for test one and test two is also very uh, helpful because again, similar questions. So uh, quest, uh, test number three's practice test is posted in your D2L shell. If you go under content and then under test prep, you'll see uh, this document that we're going through. We don't publish an answer key other than this video. Um, and that's simply because we want you to actually work it out on your own. It's not helpful for you to just watch the video and assume that that means you now know it. You really need to go work these problems yourself and make sure that you are comfortable with them. So without further ado, I'm gonna run through these questions and we're gonna figure out how to approach them. So question one here asks, what is the output of the following code? And it looks like we have a couple of variables and some kind of a loop that's going to run for a moment. So anytime you see something like that, you do have a piece of scratch paper with you and a pen, and you should be able to use that scratch paper just to keep track of those variables. So it looks like in this page, we have an I that's equal to two. Um, so we're just going to do an I equal to two up here. And then it looks like we have a Y that's equal to 10. Um, so we're going to keep track of that. And then we have while I is less than 15. Well, 2 is certainly less than 15. So it's going to go in and it's going to do i plus equals 2. So i now becomes 4. And then it says y plus equals i. So take the value of i and add that to the y that's there, which means that the y goes to 14. All right, so we're back to the top of the loop. It's going to check the condition again. Is 4 less than 15? It certainly is. So we're going to go back into the loop. And at this point, we have i plus equals 2. So that's going to go to 6 and y plus equals i, which means that y is going to go to 20 because 14 plus 6. Back to the top of the loop, is 6 less than 15? Yes, it is. So we're going to do i plus equals 2, and we're going to do y plus equals i, which brings that to 28. Back to the top of the loop, is 8 less than 15? Yes, it is. So i plus equals 2, that gets you to 10, and then y plus equals i, which gets you to 38. Is 10 less than 15? Yes, it is. So i plus equals 2, y plus equals i. All right, and so that gets that to 50. Back to the top of the loop, is 12 less than 15? Yes, it is. So that becomes 14, and we add 14 on here, which gets us to 64. All right, is 14 less than 15? Yes, it is. So we're going to go again, i plus equals 2, that gets me to 16. And this one is going to go to 80, because 16 plus 64 is 80. All right, so now we're back to the top of the loop again, and our current value of i is 16, which is no longer less than 15, so the loop is going to break. And we're going to move on to our um, print line on the next line. So the print line is telling me to print out the current value of y, and so this is going to print out 80. If this question were actually in the test, you'd be looking at multiple choice options, but you should always trace the code first just to make sure that you understand what it's going to do. All right, so moving on to question number two. In here we have what is the output of the following code, and again we have some variables, and again you should probably use a scratch piece of paper, um, if I can remember how to change the page. All right, so we have a boolean that's happy, and happy is currently equal to true. Goodness. Okay, let's try that again. Cannot type. True. All right. And then we also have a um, z, which is equal to 7. All right, so we go into our loop. This loop produces an i, which starts off as 0. And it says i less than 5. 0 is less than 5, so we're going to go into the loop. So the first line in here is an if statement that says if i mod 2 is equal to 0. Okay, well, i is currently 0, so 0 mod 2. How many times does 2 go into 0? Well, it doesn't. And how much is left over? Well, the answer is 0. So 0 mod 2 is indeed 0. So it sets happy equal to not happy. So there's an exclamation there on front of that happy. Okay, so if we think about that for just a moment, take the current value of happy, which is true, and reverse it because that's what the not is going to do. So not true is equal to false, and then assign that to happy. Effectively, what happens is 
happy goes to false. All right. And so that's a kind of common statement that you're going to see in code where you have a Boolean and you set it equal to not itself. And that has the effect of with a Boolean changing true to false and false to true, it'll just go around in a circle. Each time you call it, it will flip from true to false or false to true. All right. So now we go down to the next line, which says Z plus equals one. So our Z goes up to eight at that point. And looks like we reached the bottom of the loop. So we're going to go back up to the top i is going to get incremented and so now it checks the condition is one less than five yes it is so we go back into the code and now we're looking at the if statement again if one mod two is equal to zero well two goes into one zero times and there's one left over so it's not equal to zero so we move on and we do the z plus one which is going to move the z up to nine and we're back to the top of the loop when we get to the top of the loop we have to increment the i i is now equal to two two is still less than five 2 mod 2 is indeed 0, because 2 goes into 2 one time, and there's 0 left over, which is what the mod function is calculating. So we are going to do um, happy reverses again. So happy goes back to true. And then the z increments again, because z plus equals 1 brings the z to a 10. Back up to the top of the loop, we need to increment the i. The i is now 3. We go back in again. 3 mod 2 is not equal to 0. So we just increment the z again. And we go back to the top of the loop. We increment the i. The i goes to 4. 4 is still less than 5. 4 mod 2 indeed is 0 because 2 goes into 4 two times with 0 left over. So we're going to reverse the happy again. And it goes back to false. And we come down and we do z plus equals 1. So the z gets up to 12. All right, we go back up to the top of the loop, and it does increment the i again, because each time you reach the top of the loop, a for loop will increment the i, because that's what it's told to do. But then it checks the condition. It says, is 5 less than 5? And the answer to that is no, it is not. So it's going to jump out of the loop. And at this point, we're down to the if statement that's down below. So the if statement says, if z is greater than 13, so we have 12 greater than 13, as the first thing that it's looking at. And then we have and happy. Well, happy needs to be equal to true, but in this case, happy is currently equal to false. So um, this ends up being false because 12 is of course not greater than 13. And this ends up being false. And when you add two falses together, you get false. Now, to be clear, the way that uh, and works both sides must be true in order to um, have it be true. So in actuality, either of these being false is enough to um, make it be false um, because and requires both sides to be true. So the final answer here is false for that if statement. So it's going to print out no with an exclamation mark. All right. And that same code is down there in C-sharp. I think it's pretty much identical except for the spelling of Boolean. Um, so generally here, a couple of things to look out for in this question and these types of questions. Make sure you understand how Booleans work. Make sure you understand how to trace a loop. Make sure that you understand how complex conditionals work where you have ands and ors and nots and all of that stuff mixed together. All of those are important topics. Um, the other important thing to get out of this is do what I'm doing right here on this screen, which is keeping track of all of the variables on a piece of paper. If you do this, you'll end up with the right answer. If you try to do it all in your head, look at how many things changed on this page. Do you think you're gonna get all of that right in your head? I mean, you might, but you probably won't. So just use a piece of paper, all right? Okay, so that brings us to question number three. How do you write an overloaded constructor and what is it used for? Okay, so again, these are going to be multiple choice questions. They're not actually going to be fill in the blank, um, but uh, we certainly could ask you something like this and we would give you a few different options. So let's just talk about what constructors are and let's talk about what they're used for. So when you have a class and we'll do class bed, you might have a constructor and that's just going to be a public bed, which would look like that. And then your class itself, of course, has its open and close. So this is a constructor for the class bed. The reason it's a constructor, there's a couple of things. The name of the constructor exactly matches the name of the class. That's what makes something a constructor. The fact that there's no return type in here is the other clue. Normally, you would say public void bed or public int bed to tell you what it's returning. But in this case, it's not returning anything. So therefore, it is just 
a uh, constructor. All right, so a constructor runs at the time that you make a class. And what I mean by that is, if I were to go out into my main method, I could say bed, my bed equals new bed. And that is going to create me a bed. Now, there's a couple of things to notice here when you do that. Notice that I did new bed, which bed is the name of the class, but then there was a set of parentheses and they were empty. And if we go back to our definition here, you'll notice that the parentheses were empty here. That's because I'm calling the default constructor. I want a default bed, whatever a default bed is. So if this is some kind of a game and there's a bed and you can have different kinds of beds, this bed is going to be whatever the default is. Now, maybe there's another version of the, in the game where you can get a more complicated bed. Maybe you can get like a day bed, or maybe you can get a futon, or maybe you can get, um, I don't know, a hammock. And so each of those might take in parameters to specify what that bed is going to look like. And so we might have another version of the constructor. So public bed, which may take in a type. And that's where you would indicate that you want a hammock or that you want a, a futon or whatever it is that you're trying to make. And there would be some code in here to actually set up the bed appropriately. So this is an overloaded constructor, and it's overloaded because I have two different methods that are the same name, but they have different parameters inside of their parentheses. One of them has nothing, and the other one takes in a parameter. And you can have as many of these as you want. So I could have another public bed that takes in an int, and another public bed that takes in a string and an int, and another public bed that takes in a float, and another public bed that takes in a double. So I could have 15 of these constructors if that's what I needed. Which leads to the question, well, why do we have constructors? Well, at the time that the bed is created, I probably need to set up the bed, right? I need to have all the things about the bed set up in the program. So if, you know, again, this is a game and somebody's going to walk into the bedroom and they're going to want to be able to get into the bed, what color is the bed? What color are the bed sheets? Does it have pillows? Is it, you know, anything of those kinds of questions are things that should be set up in the constructor. At the time you make the bed in the game, you actually need to set all of the attributes of the class. And typically a class would have a bunch of attributes up at the beginning, right? It might have a string for the color of the sheets. It might have a Boolean that says, is it a futon? It might have another Boolean that says, is it an air mattress? It might have another, and so on and so forth. You might have lots of different attributes. So effectively what happens with the constructor is that it sets all of those attributes for you at the time somebody creates a bed. So in my main method, this creates a default bed, whatever a default bed looks like. And if I wanted to create the other type, um, we'll call this one your bed, I guess, um, then you would say your bed equals new bed. And this time we would pass futon. Oh, I can't spell futon. Let's do air mattress. <laughs> All right. And then that's what makes it into an air mattress or whatever it is that you're going to make. All right, so you can make as many different beds as you want because that's how objects work. And each time you can either choose the default constructor or you can choose the one of the overloaded constructors. So back to the question. The question asked, how do you write an overloaded constructor? The short answer to that is you have multiple constructors where one of them, each of them has a different set of parameters that come into the constructor where no parameter, one parameter, two parameters, three parameters, or it could be that there's multiple with one parameter, they just have different types. So an overloaded con constructor, and in general, an overloaded method, doesn't matter whether it's a constructor or not, must have different number, type, or order of the parameters. So what I mean by that is you can't have two public beds that take in string type, string, but you can definitely have two different beds that take in a string and an int and an int and a string because the order of those two is different. So the order has to be different, the type has to be different, or the number of parameters has to be different in order for this to work out. That's troubling. Okay, so the next question is, why do we use encapsulation and what are getters and setters? All right, so encapsulation is where we have a class that has variables in it. And so we'll call it my class. And it has a bunch of attributes in here. So for example, maybe we have um, int name, or sorry, int age, and we might have string name. Okay, so the reason that we do this, that we would put these inside of a class, because of course we could have just put those attributes into our main class. So why did we put them into this subclass? 
Well, the answer is that we would make sure that age can only be affected by using methods that are inside of my class. And so an example method might be a setter where I'm allowed to set the value of age. So we would have void, probably public void, set name or set age. And set age is going to need to take in an int because, well, I'm going to set it to a new age. So I have to know what the actual age is that you want me to set it to. And it's just going to say age equals new age. All right. And so that's an example of a setter. Now, that's a very, very simple one. And that's generally what we see when we write these types of things. But does that make a whole lot of sense? Should somebody be able to say that the age of this character, or the age of this person is 700? Well, it depends on the circumstance. Certainly there are possible creatures that can live that long. I don't know. And in a game, maybe things live longer. But in general, there's probably some set of rules as to what a reasonable age is. And generally, you can't have a negative age, right? So if age is greater than zero, then maybe you do this. Otherwise, maybe you're going to throw some kind of exception, or maybe you're going to print out that that's not acceptable, or whatever it is that you're going to do to handle that fact. Or maybe you just always set the age to zero if they try to give you a negative age. So what I'm saying here is the reason for the getters and the setters is that you want to be able to enforce certain rules about the variables that are in the class. You don't want to allow people to just set things to random numbers because then that's going to cause problems. How do you render a negative 15-year-old person? Well, I have no idea. I have no idea how you would draw that. How do you draw a 15-year-old? How do you draw a 30-year-old? Yeah, we probably have rules for how to do that. How do you draw a 6,000-year-old? Maybe that makes sense in your game. Maybe it doesn't make sense. So those are questions you need to think through. And the setter enforces those rules for you. It prevents somebody from getting your character or your object into a bad state by ensuring that what is being passed in is actually what's being used. So that's the reason that we have setters and constructors. And that's the reason why we put attributes into a class is so that we make them so that no one can mess with them except through our provided mechanisms, which the setters and the constructor are the provided mechanisms. And then once we have that in place, it's impossible for somebody to end up with a weird age that isn't possible in the game. And while that doesn't seem important right now, just think about some piece of software that you have used and imagine how many classes there probably are in that piece of software. It's probably thousands. Would you know the rules of every single variable in every one of those if you were asked to make changes to the code? No, of course not. So each person man maintains and enforces the rules that matter to them for the code that they're maintaining, and then everybody else will run into those restrictions if they try to do something wrong. So if somebody tries to call this and set the age to negative two, they're going to get an error back from this else condition, whether it's a thrown exception or whether it's a printed out message on the screen or something on a log file, they're going to know that what they did was wrong. So the question asked, what is the point of encapsulation? How do we use it? And why are there getters and setters? And the answer is encapsulation is putting attributes into a class and putting all of the meaning of that class together such that all of the methods and all the attributes related to that class are in one file in one class. And then the only way to modify the things inside of there is to use the provided getters and setters, mostly the setters to modify them, um, in order to be able to uh, ensure consistency and ensure that the code is not getting into a bad place. And like other examples of that, if you have a window on your desktop and you pick it up, you know that there's rules about where you can put the window, right? So here's a little calculator that I just opened. And I can drag this calculator around, sure. But can I drag it completely off the screen? No, it stops me from doing that. Can I draw it completely off the top? No. Can I draw drag it all the way off the left and right? No, eventually it just in, grows into a different size. And even when I uh, start moving it around, you can see that there's rules about how big I can make it and how small I can make it. I can never fully get rid of it because if I fully got rid of it, how would I ever reopen it? So every piece of code that you're going to use has some amount of built-in logic that prevents it from being in a bad state, and that's encapsulation. All right, so that's question number four. Question number five, after this code runs, what does my stuff look like? 
Okay, so again, we're going to want to draw this one out. This looks like it is a two-dimensional array. And so if this was in Java, you would have int square bracket square bracket. If this is C sharp, it would just be int square bracket with a comma and then a square bracket, but it's otherwise the same code. So what's happening here is we have an array that is an array of integers, and it appears to be five by five. So if I were to draw this guy out, what it would look like is, oh goodness, what have I done? Um, it would look like a rectangle. And in that rectangle, we would have five by five. Um, and we know it's five by five because that's what it says to do. So one, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three, four, five. Okay. And the way that two dimensional arrays work is they are always numbered from zero, just like everything else. Zero, one, two, three, four. All right, so my two dimensional array would look like that. And very specifically, what this code does is it says for i equals zero, i less than five, i plus plus, my stuff two i plus equals i. All right, so my stuff two refers to this row. So the first number that you see is the row, and the second number that you see is the column. So very specifically, my stuff two at position i starts off at zero, and it sets it to i which is zero, and then one, and then two, and then three, and then four. That's what that array would look like. So the first number in a two-dimensional array is going to be the row. The second number in a two-dimensional array is going to be the column. And then in this case, we're just iterating through that column and putting values in there. All right, question number six, what is the output of the following code? Okay, so generally when you're looking at something like this, I would start off in the main method because that's where the computer is going to start. So I'm going to look down here where I just added the little circle and I'm going to begin in main. So again, we have some variables and we need to keep track of those variables. And here we have an X, which is equal to A, um, which is a character A. And then we have a call to a method called change X. Well, let's go find that method. It looks like it's right up here where I'm doing a little circle. And so change X seems to take in a character and it seems to do a plus plus on the character. Okay, so a couple of things to think about there. Is it possible to do a plus plus on a character? And the answer is yes. Um, we wouldn't ask you to memorize this, so certainly don't try to memorize an ASCII table. But every character on your keyboard is just stored as a number to the computer. And those are called ASCII values. And so, you know, the letter A has one value, the letter B has another. And it turns out when they drew the ASCII table, they're all sequential. So A is next to B, is next to C, is next to D, just like you would expect it to be. So in actuality, if you give a lowercase a and you do a plus plus on that variable, it will become B. And that will be true all the way up to Z. Now, once you pass Z, it gets a bit weirder because there's other characters on your keyboards like exclamations and pound signs and dollar signs and all that kind of stuff. And those are also in the ASCII table. So if you go past Z, it just goes into the weirder characters. Um, and then the other thing to be aware of is that the capital letters come before the lowercase ones. So if you go past a capital Z, after a couple more plus pluses, you'll end up with lowercase a. But anyway, the point of all of this is that if you have a call to a method charge x, or sorry, change x here, um, change x takes in a character and it does a plus plus on it. I'm going to draw this out in an activation stack as if we were thinking about recursion. Um, so in our main method, we had an x and it's currently equal to a. And then we have this call to change x. And so change x is a new call on the activation stack. So change x, and it was passed in a. All right, so in this version of the activation stack, it has a character x, which is what I'm highlighting there, which is going to be set to a. And so I need you to be aware that this x and the x that's down below are completely independent x's. When you make a call to a method and it's a primitive type like this, a whole new variable is created. The fact that they're both called x is irrelevant, this X on this second layer is a completely new X that has nothing to do with the X on the layer below. So inside of this method, it asks me to change X plus plus. And anytime that you're changing something, it only changes in the method that you're in. So X is now going to become equal to B because that's what it said to do. A, a plus plus, as I mentioned, gives you a B. So the X in this method is B, but the X down in the main method never changed. Again, because we passed a primitive type here. So what happens when this pops off the stack because this method ends is that this X is simply thrown away and we're right back down in main again 
and we move on to the next line of code, which says to print out x is x. And when that happens, you're going to get x is a down in main. Because as far as main is concerned, it was a, it has always been a, this other weird x that happened, it actually has no idea about that at all. So I need you to remember that anytime you are passing a primitive type, and a primitive type again are ints and cars and bools and floats and doubles and bytes and shorts and longs and all those are primitive types. Anytime you pass a primitive type into a method, the method gets its own copy of that variable and that copy has nothing to do with the original variable down in main. All right, so this code continues and now it says just num a equals new just number. Well, just number is a class that's up at the top here and it just seems to have a public character x in it that is equal to c. All right, so what happened here, and I'm just going to expand out my little activation stack to make this a little bit clearer so you can see it. What happens here is that I'm making a new object down in main. And this is happening in main because, well, that's where it's happening. And in main, it created an object called A. So that A is drawn like this. Now you might say, wait, why are you doing an arrow like this is a linked list? Well, it's, it's always been like this. It's just that we never really drew it this way in the beginning. We always drew it as a separate, um, as a box. And the reality is the arrow has always been there. It's just now that you've seen linked lists, we're going to draw it as an arrow. So A points to this new object. And inside that new object, we have a character X, which is equal to C. All right. And so that's how that looks. Now, our next line of code makes a call to just change num, which is this method right here. And just change num takes in an object, and it calls the object x. Of course it does. Why would it be anything else? So up here we have just change num, which I'm going to abbreviate to JCN, and it takes in an x. Well, what it creates is a local variable called x, and it's given a copy of the link that was A, because it was A that's passed to this. So this arrow that I'm drawing down here, that is what's copied up here. And so in reality, what happens is that the X points to that same block of memory that's down in A. And I want you to realize that it didn't get a copy of the object, it got a link to the object. And that's how passing objects works. When you pass a primitive type, a copy of the value is moved up. But when you move an object up, a copy of the link is, is brought up, or a copy of that arrow effectively. So now, when we are running up in here in our just change, our change just number uh, code, it says x dot x plus plus. Well, that says take the x, follow it down until you find an x, and change that to plus plus, which is going to change our c to a d down in that little box. Notice that what was changed here was also changed in main. The A has also been changed down here because it's a single object. All right, so now uh, that method pops off the stack and that arrow gets deprovisioned, it's gone now. And so we're back down into our main method and the main method asks me to print out A.X. Well, if I take A and I follow it and I look for the X, I'm going to get a D. And so in this case, it says other x is d. And that's from this code right down here, a.x. So the, there's a huge difference in these two different parts of this same code. The first one was passed as a primitive type. It was an integer or a character in this case. And when a primitive type is passed up, a copy of its value is what's passed up. But when an object is passed up, a link to the object is what's actually passed. And so if you change the primitive type in the method, nothing happens in main. But if you change the object in the method, it does change it. So if you're wondering why this is the case, let's talk about this just very briefly. Objects mimic the real world. If we, if you and I, the two of us watching this video right now, were to share something, we share this video. To me, this video is my video. But to you, you know it as this video that you're watching or video number one or whatever you're calling it in your playlist. So it's the same video. If I come in and I change it while you're watching it, 
then you would see the new updated video because it's one video. It's an object in the real world. And likewise, if we shared a chair or if we shared a table or if we shared anything else in the real world, if one of us makes a change to it, it's changed for all of us. So an object, when it's passed to a method, is actually shared between the method and the main method or from the calling method specifically. And logically, that seems to make sense, but it actually has an even bigger reason. If I pass a primitive type up to a method, how much space is it going to occupy when it has to make a copy of that data? Well, an integer takes up 32 bits and a character takes up about the same amount as well. And so realistically, copying the number or the, the character A up there took up 32 bits of memory. And that's the worst case scenario. There's no, there's no integer that takes up more than 32 bits. There's longs that take up 64 bits, but really all primitive types are actually very, very small. But now let's think about an object for a student where it has a name and a list of all the classes and all your grades and your address and your KSU ID and your numbers and social security numbers and phone numbers and all GPAs. All of that is a lot more than 32 bits. And if you can imagine a circumstance where maybe you're passing an object to a method, which is then going to recursively pass it to itself over and over again, each recursive call would necessitate it making a whole other copy of the object if that's how it worked, which could be huge. If the object was a meg in size, if there was a million bits in there, then every time you made a recursive call, it would use up another meg of memory, which is a lot. And on a phone, you don't have that much memory. You've probably got two gigs or four gigs or maybe eight gigs, but that's about it. So a meg is a huge amount of memory to be using just to pass information into a method. So that's not what happens. It just makes it one copy of it and it puts a lot of links to it because the links are cheap and easy. The links only take up 32 bits. So passing a link up as opposed to passing the entire object and making a copy of the object makes a lot more sense from the design of the language. And so all languages do this, where the object is held off in something called a heap, which is off to the side, and you just get references to it, which are those arrows that we've always been drawing. Okay, so the short version of this, primitive types, all the normal primitive types that you've talked about before are passed where the value is copied up into the method, but objects are passed where the link to the object is passed up. All right, so that brings us to our next question. What is the output of the following code? So again, we have some stuff going on here. We're going to start down in main. And so we have int answer equals a3. And then there's another call to a with a b. Now, immediately, you can kind of look at this and go, huh, there's something, oh, goodness, there's something weird going on down here insofar as there's two calls to the same method but the method is taking in different parameters. In the first case, the method is taking in an integer, and in the second case, the method is taking in a character. So what we have here is an overloaded method. It's a method that takes in two different parameters. One time it takes in an int, one time it takes in a car, and it behaves differently in both cases. The method is called a in both cases. That's the nature of an overloaded method. And the return type is the same, which in actuality, they don't have to be the same, but generally they are the same in an overloaded method. Okay. So in our first call, we pass a the number three, which is going to call this method up on top. And so that is going to return for us the number two, because that's what that method does. So regardless of what's passed in, it always returns two. So a three is going to be the number two. A b, on the other hand, is going to make a call to this method. And in this case, it's a b that's being passed in. And so since that doesn't equal a, we're going to go to the else part and we're going to return nine. So in the end, this got back a two from the first call and a nine from the second call. It adds them together and you're going to end up with 11. What this question is testing is that you understand how overloaded methods work. If you have many different methods that take in different parameters, at the time it's running it, it checks to see what the type of the parameter is that you're trying to pass and it matches the best method that matches that type, which if it's an int, it's going to be an int. And if it's a car, it's going to be a car. Okay, so here we have uh, the next question, question number eight. Given the following code, and we have a class X, which seems to have an int and some protected uh, methods and a public method inside of it. And then which of the following lines of code will cause a compile error? Okay, so um, in our uh, first class here, we have class Y, which seems to extend X. And class Y has a method called B, which is allowed. All right, so the first line of code that we have to look at is A++. All right, so clearly class Y doesn't have a variable called A, 
But because it's extending another object, which in this case is x, and x does have an a, and because um, that a up here is private, the question that this is really asking is, can you see that a down in class y? And the answer is no, you cannot, simply because of the word that's highlighted. Because it is a private attribute, class y cannot see that a. Only public and protected attributes are passed down to their children. And in this case, that is a private attribute, so it is not passed down. So line one will cause a compile error. It will actually tell you that a is protected and the permissions do not permit it to be seen in y. So that one is a problem. Let's keep going. The next line says set a nine. So again, I have no method called set a down here in y, but I do have a set a up here in x and the set a method was passed publicly down to me. So that means that the parent had a public method set a and the child inherited that set a method. So yes, I can absolutely call set a and pass it a nine down here in my class y. So line two is not a problem. All right, down in main, we are creating a couple of um, objects. We created an X, which is a my X, and a Y, which is a my Y, and that's all fine. Both of those are allowed because the two classes here are presumed to be public, and they're both concrete. None of them are abstract. So then down at the line three here, we have my X dot A equals 10. Okay, so for class X, can I get to the A from outside of the class in an object? And again, the answer is no, because that's private. So to be clear, the difference between line one and line three is in line one, I was trying to inherit that A from the parent, and I couldn't do it because it was private. In line three down here, I'm trying to access an attribute in an object. This is an object now. And it's still private, so I still can't do it. So in both cases of line one and line three, it is not permissible to call, um, or sorry, to access that A and make changes to it or see it or anything else from outside of class X. Any code in class X is allowed to access it. And you can see that happens in the get A and the set A methods, but outside of class X, it can't be messed with because it's private. All right, so that brings us to line four. We're attempting to call set A, and that is a public method so therefore, that is no problem. Line four will work just fine. Uh, line five, we are attempting to access A through the Y class. Well, that's definitely not going to work. If it didn't work in the X class, it's certainly not going to work in the Y class. So no, line five is also going to cause a compile error. And then in line six, we have set A in the Y class. Okay, now that one's a bit weird, and you need to think about that for just a moment. Class Y does not have a method called set A but it inherited one from its parent called set A, and it inherited because it was public. So can you call set A on class Y? The answer is yes, you absolutely can. Because it inherited from the parent and because it's public, you can call set A either through the my X object or through the my Y object, it works either way. So that's that one is fine. And then our last line here is, can I call my Y um, dot B as a method? And yes, the answer is I can absolutely call that. Um, so in the end, the compile errors were on lines one, three, and five, anytime we tried to access that A variable from anywhere. Question nine, what is the name of the parent class for class X? So we're given a class X here, and nowhere in there does it say extends any other object or a colon any other object, it just says class X. So who is class X's parent? And the answer to that is object because everybody is a child of object unless specified otherwise. So class X automatically extends object. So the code could be written class X extends object or class X colon object, depending on the language, and it would mean exactly the same as what's highlighted there on your screen. Question number 10, is the following valid? Okay, so we have an abstract class X. It has a public int method A, and it also has a public abstract int method B. Okay, so at a quick glance, this all looks reasonable, but there is actually a problem. This will not compile. So an abstract class is absolutely allowed to have an a concrete method, which is what's happening here, and it's also absolutely allowed to have an abstract method, which is what's happening here. The problem is that when you declare a method abstract, 
you are forbidden from putting these curly braces at the end because that's where the body of the method would go. And even though the curly braces are empty, that is still considered a body to that method. So the part that's highlighted is the only part that's a problem. Everything else about that is completely valid, but you cannot have those curly braces. There should just be a semicolon at the end of that public abstract int method B. All right, so to be clear on that one, abstract classes can have concrete methods, which is what's happening up here. Abstract classes can have abstract methods, which is happening here up to this point. They just cannot have abstract methods with bodies, which is what's actually happening there. All right, question 11. What is the difference between an overloaded method and an overridden method? So what's different between the two? The words sound very similar. So let's start off with overridden. So where we just were looking at in a question two questions ago, it asked, what is the parent of class X? And the answer to that was object. So object has a method in it called toString. And what toString does is if you use any object as if it is a string, toString is automatically called. It's a capital T in C sharp and a lowercase t in Java. But other than that, they are identical. They return a string. And so if I have a dog class and I attempt to system.out.println or console.writeline my dog, what happens? And, and it doesn't make sense that I would be able to print a dog because what should the dog print as? And the answer is object has a default to string that in C sharp simply prints out the name of the object or sorry, the name of the class. And in Java, it prints out the name of the class followed by a random memory address as to where it's stored to that class. So that's not particularly useful. And very often you're going to want the dog when you print the dog to say, hi, my name is Fluffy and I am a border collie. And so it can't do that unless you tell it how to do that. So the problem is when you wrote the dog class, you inherited a two string from your parent object, but you don't like it. You want it to do something else. You would override two string. You would give a new definition of two string that specif specifically outputs, hi, my name is whatever the dog's name is, and I am a whatever the breed is. So that's an override. An override means you inherited something from your parent and you don't like it and you want to change it. You want to override what your parent gave you. It is impossible to have an override without inheritance. You must be inheriting something to override it. You can't write a method in one class and then override it in the same class. That doesn't make any sense. You can override a class or a method that you inherited from your parent. So an overridden method or an override method is where you disliked something you inherited from your parent and you want to change it, which you probably have done in your real life. An overloaded method, on the other hand, is where you have a method that has multiple different versions of that same method with the different parameters. And that's like what we saw the overloaded constructor and when we saw the overloaded method that took in a car and another overloaded method that took in an int here. So it's an overloaded method is a method that has the same name, the same return type usually, but different number, type, or order of parameters that are being passed in. And just as an aside, it is possible to have overloaded methods in a single class. That's the most common scenario where you have a class dog and maybe it has an eat and there's different calls to eat. One of them takes in an amount of food. Maybe one of them takes in the type of food that they ate because different things might happen with the dog depending on what they ate. And so an overloaded method, you have multiple different versions of the same method. It is possible, although unlikely, that you would have an overloaded method in a, in a child class. And an example there would be that the parent exposes two overloaded versions of a method and the child wants a third overloaded method. So the child can define another version of the parent's method just with different parameters again. That's not an override because they don't exactly match. So to be clear, in an override, all the parameters, the name and the return type all must match and you are changing the definition of the method. Whereas with an overload, you're adding a new version of the method that takes in something else. So hopefully that makes sense. Question number 12, what does the following code output? So down here in main, we have int x equals two. We have the creation of a class one class, which is down there. And then we have a print x. Okay, well, the first one's very simple because nothing happened to the x between the point when it was created and when it was printed. So the first thing is going to print two. The next thing is attempting to print y dot x. So the y comes from this definition of the class. 
And that definition of one class matches this block of code up here. And so we're trying to access an X variable up here. And this is the X variable, but you can see it's not set here. So we have to look at the constructor. So when this class was created, it was created with empty parentheses. So the default constructor would have been called, which matches this. And so at the time that the Y was created, the X inside of that class was set to five. So when I try to print out Y.X, I'm going to get a five there because of that um, constructor setting X to five. All right, and then this last one prints out Y, which is again, the name of this class, dot X parentheses. All right, so what this is asking is, what are the difference between these three X's? This X is a local X inside of main. This X is an X attribute inside of a class called one class, which we've instantiated as an object Y. And this last one is a method called X, which is also inside of class one class instantiated as object Y. So we're going to actually get an A from that last print statement. So the first print statement prints two, the second one's going to print five, and the third one's going to print a capital A. And really what matters here that you understand is that there's a difference between those two things that are highlighted. The first of the highlighted things is an attribute. It's an attribute called X. The second of those things is a method called X. They're both called X. And I need you to understand this is what this code right here explains why we continually harp on you about using good variable names. If you look at this, it's extremely confusing as to which X is which, because there's all kinds of X's and they're all completely different and have different meanings, but they're all being used in the same code. This is awful. And nobody should ever write code like this because it's very, very confusing, which is why, again, we ask you, name your variable something more appropriate to what they're doing so that when you come back and look at it, you understand what's going on. But technically, this is valid code. It's just not well written, um, where you have a local variable X, an attribute X inside of an object, and a method X inside of an object. All right, so that brings us down to question number 13 here. So down in our main method, we have the creation again of an object called Y, and Y is called with a, um, a parameter three that's passed to the constructor. So we're sending a three up to the constructor in Y. So let's go take a look at class Y. Well, this is our class Y here. It seems to be a child of X because we can see it extends X or it colon X is here. And then we have a three coming in. So there are two different constructors for class Y, one that takes in nothing and one that takes in an integer. Well, the one that we're gonna call is the one that takes in an integer because we passed it an integer. So down here when we did Y, parentheses three, that's an integer. So that matches this one, and therefore we're gonna call that. And what happens here is that y takes in that variable, that three, and it calls it c, and then it immediately makes a call to its parent, which is done either with the base or the super keyword, depending on your language, and passes it a lowercase x. So to be clear, it took in a three, which it did nothing with, and then immediately called its parent with an x. All right, so let's go take a look at class X. Well, class X has um, at least two different constructors. It has a constructor that takes in an integer and it has a constructor that takes in a character. Okay, so in this case, it was passed a character because X is a character. So what this sets is A is now equal to 10. All right, so to review, down in main, I made a Y object. The Y object was passed a three. The three caused it to call this constructor, which that constructor simply told it to call its parents constructor and passing it an X. That X, since it's a character, caused this constructor to fire, which then in turn set the A equal to 10. All right, so having said all of that, we now do a console.write line on my Y. So my Y is the name of the object that we just created, and we're going to do a print on my Y. Well, the way that that works is y is of class, uh, my y is of class y. So it's going to attempt to call the two string method in y. Well, there is no two string method in y. So it's going to go back to its parent and take a look at the two string method there. And the two string method in the parent, here's the override of two string, um, is going to return a is, in this case, 10. So what I need you to understand here is that 
this overwrite of two string is going to be true for all children down until it's overridden again. So object had one version of two string up at the very top. X did not like that version and it overwrote it, which is what's highlighted on the screen. Y was okay with the version that it got from X. Z could absolutely choose to overload it, overwrite it again, and ABC could overwrite it again, and we could keep doing that all day long. Each method gets the most recent override of a method that it inherits from above. Okay, so in the end, this printed out A is 10. All right, question number 14. What is the output of the following code? So again, we have a public static int A method, and we have our main method. So our main method simply says print out A and pass it 5. So if we go and we look at the A method, it's passed in a 5, and it says, okay, if 5 is less than 1, which it is not, otherwise we do an else, and uh-oh, this looks like we've hit recursion because we're making a call to A. So I'm going to immediately go over and find my piece of paper and my pen, and we're going to trace this guy. So nice big activation stack. We have our main method. And in our main method, we have a call to A at, oops. Okay, I don't know why I can't draw on there suddenly. Okay, let's try a new slide and see if I can draw on a new slide. Yes, I can. Great. All right. Activation, mm, activation stack, we have main, and we have um, A at 5 is what that call looks like down in main down here. Okay? All right, so that makes our first call to A. A takes in a parameter which it calls my num, and my num is going to be equal to 5 here. So a of 5 is what we're doing. And that's a 5, believe it or not. There we go. And it says, is 5 less than 1, which it is not. So it goes down to its statement down here. So it says it's supposed to return my num, which as far as it knows is 5, plus a of 5 minus 3, which is 2. OK, now. A of 2 is not something that it knows the answer to, so this method is going to pause, and we're going to have a new method that pops in above it called A of 2. And as far as this new method is concerned, my num is 2, and it begins executing the code. Is 2 less than 1? No, it's not, so it goes to the else, and it's told you need to return 2, because that's its my num, plus A of 2. 2 minus 3, which is negative 1. And again, it doesn't know the answer to a of negative 1, so it pauses, and we have a new call to a new method, which is a of negative 1. It takes in a parameter called my num, which is negative 1, and it says, is negative 1 less than 1? Well, the answer to that is yes. So in this version, it says return 4. So this returns a 4. All right, when you hit a return statement, two things happen. The first thing that happens is that the value that you are returning is sent back to the calling method. And the calling method in this case is this guy down here in the previous layer of the stack. It asked, what is a of negative 1? And now that we have a return value for that, that 4 is going to get plugged in there. All right. The second thing that the return statement does is it immediately ends a method. And this method is now done so it's going to pop off the stack, and all of that's gone. When something pops off the stack, the previous layer wakes back up again because it has now gotten control again, and it tries to continue. It was told it needs to return 2 plus what now turns out to be 4, so it says, okay, 2 plus 4 is equal to 6, that's no big deal, and it returns that because it was told to return it. So that 6 gets filled into the calling method, which was right here, and then this pops off the stack because it's done because it had a return statement. 
So now the previous layer wakes back up and it says, oh, I was asleep for a moment. I was told to add five to what now appears to be six. So the answer to that is 11. And since it has a return statement, it pops off the stack and it takes that value and it returns it to its calling method, which was in main. And if we go back and look at the code in main, the code in main actually said print that, right? So there was a console.write line for 11. And so this code is going to print out the number 11. This is how you trace a recursive method. Do not try to do it in your head. You're going to get confused. Draw the activation stack. I know you're thinking it's boring. I don't want to have to write the same thing five times. Get over it. Draw the activation stack. Put all of the variables in the activation stack, just like I did, and actually write out the return statement with the values filled in, and then just execute the code. And if you do, you will always get it right. This works 100% of the time, and I don't care if you've been doing this for 10 minutes or if you've been doing this for 30 years, this is how you trace recursion. If you try to shortcut it, you will get the wrong answer. Just trust me. It takes a moment to do this. Yes, but you'll get the right answer. You have plenty of time when you're taking the test. You have more than two minutes per question, so you can definitely take a minute to draw this activation stack. All right, so for question 15 here, um, what line is missing from the code to make a recursive method that prints out every fifth number up to the max number passed in? All right, so basically what we have is we have a recursive method, but it's missing something. So every recursive method needs to have three things. It needs to have a parameter that's coming into the method that can be changed in each recursive call, which that one has. It has to have a base condition, which is something that eventually stops the code, and that's what that is. And then it needs to have a recursive call, which is what's what's missing here. There's no call to print numbers. This is just a print to print out a number. Um, so what should this recursive call look like? Well, I mean, we can kind of extrapolate and make a couple of guesses here, even if we don't know exactly what we're doing. If it's going to be a recursive call, there's going to be a call to the method. So print numbers. So we know there's at least a print numbers. And it turns out that print numbers requires us to pass in a number. So we know that we're going to have to pass in some kind of a number each time we make a recursive call. So, I mean, we could pass in four, but if we're always passing in four, then it'll always be four. So it has to be a variable that's changing. And the other thing is that the variable needs to be getting closer to the, uh, the terminating condition. So the only variable we have in this method is max. So clearly it's going to be max. And in order for it to be getting closer to the terminating condition, well, the terminating condition is that max eventually reaches zero. So we're going to have to be getting smaller, which seems to imply we're going to be subtracting something from max. And then the next question is, well, what are we subtracting? So now we got to go back up and reread the question. What line is missing from the code to make a recursive method that prints out every fifth number up to the max number passed in. So if the number passed in is 10, it's supposed to do 10, 5, 0, right? Um, so every fifth number seems to imply that we're going to subtract 5 from it in each call. Now, that's our recursive call. That's actually all that's missing. So print numbers max minus 5. But I want to take this and just trace through it, even though this is not what this question is asking us to do. The correct answer to this question is what's written on the screen there, um, print numbers max minus 5. But I want to trace this guy because I want you to understand how this works, because it's odd that this method is going to print all of the numbers up to the max. But the way recursion works is you're going backwards, and that's, that's a bit non-intuitive. And really, the reason that this is going to print them out in order is because of the placement of the print statement. If the print statement is before a recursive call, then the print statement is going to cause us to do the printing forward, which in this case would be getting smaller because we're subtracting from the number. If the print statement is after the recursive call, then we're going to see it happen in reverse. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's pretend that we call this with print numbers, and I'm just going to abbreviate that to PN with the number 10. So our first call here to PN 10 is going to start off and look at this code, and it's going to say max is 10. And then it says, is 10 greater than 0? Well, yes, it is. 10 is indeed greater than 0. So it's going to do our recursive call here, which is going to call print numbers 10 minus 5, which is just going to be 5. All right. Now, bear in mind that where it left off was here, the part that's highlighted. 
there's still work that needs to be done in this method, but it can't do it right now because it's waiting for this to return. And this isn't returned right now. We have to go continue all the way up the stack until we hit our terminating condition. All right, so this makes a call to print numbers with five. And in here, max is five. And that says is five greater than zero, which of course it is. So it makes a recursive call to print numbers with a zero because five minus five is indeed zero. And again, there's work to be done underneath that, but we're not there yet right now. We have to go deal with the recursive call because that's next. So that makes our call to print numbers of zero. In here, max is zero. All right, so look at our if statement. If zero is greater than zero, well, it isn't. Zero is not greater than zero, so we're gonna skip to the end of that if statement. And we're going to continue on with whatever code is below that if statement, which in this case, there's nothing. As a matter of fact, the method just ends. So to be clear, this method popped onto the stack, max was set to zero, it looked at the first line of code, which said max is not greater than zero, and it immediately ends. This pops off the stack, having done literally nothing, kind of a waste of time, really. But the previous method went to sleep at the point when print number zero was called which was this line of code. So now it wakes up and continues on with the next line of code, which is to print max. And to it, max is equal to five. So that's going to print out a five. And then it moves on to the next line of code, which is a closing curly brace and a closing curly brace. And again, this method is done and it's going to pop off the stack. And then this method down here is going to wake up. It just made a recursive call, which was here. So it moves on to its next line of code, which is a 10 print out of a 10, and then it pops off the stack, and we are back down to main, where we continue on with whatever the next line of code is. Now, there's a few things to realize here. The first thing is that this is a recursive method that returns void, which is absolutely allowed. All recursive methods do not return a number, even though most of the examples we show you, like factorial and Fibonacci and power and all of those returned numbers, but there's no rule that says a recursive method has to return a number. This one returns void. So then what's its point? Well, it's doing a print statement as it's going through things and it's printing stuff out as it goes, and that's perfectly allowed as well. So because it's a void method, it can't return anything, so there's no return statement in here, which is also unusual. Usually the recursive line would have said return print numbers max minus five, but here we're not returning anything, so there is no return on there. It's literally just print numbers max minus five. So that's the first thing to notice. The second thing is what I alluded to earlier. The fact that this print statement is after the recursive call is why the numbers came out in order, 5, 10, 15, and so on and so forth. If I call this with print numbers up to 100, I would get 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, all the way up to 95, and then 100. Um, so I need you to realize the fact that this is down underneath the recursive call is what's causing that. Had I put that print statement before the recursive call, then what I would have actually got is 10, 5. I would have gotten them in the other order. And that's a useful property of recursion, which is it allows you to get stuff either forwards or backwards, just depending on where you put the print statement in there. So that's pretty cool. All right, question number 16. What is the output of the following code? All right, so what's going on here is we have some recurs uh, some calls to uh, methods that are in try blocks. And uh, probably a hint just looking at this question. The fact that there's a try here means something is going to go horribly wrong inside of our do stuff. But let's go ahead and, tr and test what's going on in do stuff. So in do stuff, we create an array of integers that is of size 10. And so that creates an array and it's got 10 cells, which are numbered zero through nine, of course. Then underneath that, um, we have a for loop that starts off with i equal to zero, i less than or equal to 10. Okay, so i is zero, it'll do the thing. i is one, it'll do the thing through two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then even when i is 10, it will do the thing. Well, the thing that it's doing is it's attempting to at, put something into the array at position 10. Well, there is no position 10, there's position zero through nine. So on the 10th iteration of the loop, and only the 10th iteration of the loop, um, actually, I guess the 11th iteration of the loop, this is going to fail. And the reason it's going, or the way it's going to fail is you're going to get an index out of bounds exception or an array out of bounds exception, depending on your language. So this is going to throw an exception. And the important thing about a try block to be aware of is when you are in a try block, the moment an exception happens, the try block stops. 
it will not continue and do the remaining code. So I need you to understand that this print statement will never happen in either of the languages. And it's simply because the moment that an exception was thrown and do stuff, we jump out of the try and we immediately try to find the corresponding catch and we never come back to the try again. So in actuality, the output of this code is simply B. It will never print an A, even though it seems like it probably might, it will only print B. And so if this was a multiple choice question, you'd have A, AB, or B as your options, and the correct answer is just B. All right. Um, similarly to what's going on down here, um, we're going to take a look at um, the code, and we're going to start off, and again, we have a try block, and here we have um, the stuff that's going on. So we have do stuff negative one. All right, so we call do stuff, it's going to take in a negative one. And up here, this creates an array of um, an array of 10 integers. If x is less than zero, then it's going to throw an exception. All right, well, it was passed a negative one, which indeed is less than zero. So of course, this is going to throw an exception. The particular exception here is of type exception, because that's what it's told to throw. And the message that it's throwing is x less than zero. So again, immediately upon there being a, an exception inside of a try block, it's just going to jump straight out of here. So none of the code down below that is going to execute, and we're going to go down and try to find the appropriate exception that matches. And in this case, the exception that matches is going to be exception, because that's what was thrown. So this is going to print out error 2. And that's it. It doesn't do anything else. It just prints error 2, simply because of line 1. All right. And then next up, uh, it asks question 18, if you comment out line one, then now what is the output of the code? Okay, so if you don't do this line, if this is just turned off somehow, then the question is, does do stuff nine cause a problem? So let's take a look at our code. This creates an array of 10 cells. It says if nine is less than zero, which it isn't, else it seems to go from i equals zero, i up to and including nine, i plus plus, and it sets uh, the array at those positions. That's going to work for 9 because there's 0 through 9. That's not going to be an issue. So line 2 is going to work just fine. When we get to line 3, we pass it a 10. Again, it creates an array of 10. It checks to see if 10 is less than 0, which it isn't. And then again, what's going to happen is when it goes into this loop, it's going to go up to and including 10. It's actually the same code as the previous question at this point, And that's going to throw an array index out of bounds or array out of bounds um, or sorry, index out of bounds exception. So when the exception is thrown here, it's actually an index out of bounds exception. And so without line one, this is going to print error one. So a couple of things to get out of this. The type of exception has to match the catch block in order for the catch block to be able to successfully catch it. Um, the, um, the, uh, the second one causes an actual index out of bounds or index out of range. Um, exception to be thrown. And so that's the one that fires. And again, remember that in a try block, nothing happens once an exception is thrown. All right, so question number 19, what is the content of a.txt after the following code executes? So we have here a call to a write file, which is a method that we have defined up here. Write file takes in a string, another string, and an integer. And in this case, it's being passed a.txt, test, and four. So the question is, what is in a.txt at the end of this uh, method. So we begin by creating a stream writer or a print writer, and that will create a file in order for us to be able to write the file. Um, the Java code is the file and print writer. Then we seem to have a loop that does for i equals zero, i less than x. x appears to be the number that's passed in third, so that's gonna be our four. So i equals zero, i less than four, i plus plus, j equals zero, j less than four, j plus plus. So each of these loops are going to go four times and it's nested. So effectively that loop, that loop is going to go a total of 16 times. The inner loop is going to print out line, which in this case is the word test followed by a space. So we're going to get test, 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 test. That's going to be the four of those. And then that whole thing is repeated four times with a carriage return in between. So it's going to be test, 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 test on one line, and then next line, test, 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 and then next line, test, 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 and then finally, last line, uh, test, 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 test. So ultimately, um, that gives us a total amount 
of 16 tests that are in a block of four by four is what that's going to output. All right, question number 20. What line is missing below if the code is to read file a.txt and print it on the screen? So uh, in both languages here, we have a call to read file and read file is either using a stream reader or it is using a file and a scanner to read the file. And then you've got a while loop with a comment that's asking what's missing here. And then it seems like we're reading out a line and printing the line in each case. So the question is, what should be inside of these parentheses? Um, and it is slightly different between the languages. So the Java code that would be missing here is my scan, which is the um, name of the scanner, dot has next line parentheses. And the C sharp code would be while not my scan dot end of stream. So not end of stream in C sharp or has next lines in Java is what it is that um, we are doing here. So that's what's missing over there. All right, brings us on to question number 21. Um, so down here we have a class uh, which is do stuff and that class is going to be used as a thread. Um, over in Java, it is implementing runnable. In C Sharp, it doesn't have to. In Java, runnable implies it has to be called run. In C Sharp, it could be called whatever you want to call it. Um, but down in our main here, we create an object of that class, and that happens in both languages. That's the same. And then we try to make a new thread. In Java, because it's implicit that it's called run, you just say thread x equals new thread. Whereas over in C Sharp, you have to tell it where you want the thread to start, and that's done with an object called thread start. Um, and so my run, my stuff dot run is going to be the actual uh, running uh, code up here. And so that just tells it this is how you're going to start. It's dot run is the method that you want to call. There's actually a little more flexibility in C sharp. It allows you to have multiple different methods and each thread could be running different methods. Whereas in Java, you'd have to make separate objects for each of them. That's why this is kind of cool. But in the end, they both say thread x equals new thread and the appropriate thing in parentheses. And the question is, well, how do you actually start the thread? A very common misconception is that what you would say is my stuff, which is the name of the object, dot run. And indeed, that will cause it to execute the code. So if I said my stuff dot run, you would indeed have a running code. But let's imagine you had 100 threads and you wanted to run them in parallel, which is the whole point of writing threads. If you were to do my stuff dot run, it'll run the first thread then it will run the second thread, then it will run the third thread. They will not be in parallel, even if there's capability to be in parallel. If you want them to start in parallel, you must say x, which is the name of your thread, dot start, which is not code that's written on the screen anywhere, but that's just how you tell a thread to start. So you correctly, the correct answer to this question is x dot start. So just keep that in mind. All right, question number 22, what's the difference between an interface and an abstract class? All right, so there are three different kinds of um, classes or uh, interfaces that you can have. You can have a concrete class, which is all classes that we've written like this one up here. These are all concrete classes. They're not declared to be abstract and they're not in an interface, they're concrete. Meaning every method has a body, all of everything is fleshed out. It's a fully concrete um, class. So that's, that's one extreme. The opposite extreme is an interface. And in an interface, every method is abstract. You just simply tell it the name of the method and what parameters it's going to take, and that's it. You don't actually pass it anything else. So those are the two extremes. An abstract class is somewhere in the middle. An abstract class can be just like a concrete class because it can be declared abstract but have all concrete methods, and that's perfectly allowed or it can be declared abstract and have all abstract methods, that's perfectly allowed, or it can be anywhere in the middle where it is some amount abstract and some amount concrete. So again, there's a scale here. On one end, you have concrete classes. On the other end, you have interfaces. And in between those two, you have an abstract class which can be anywhere in between them, including all the way up to the end on either side. And it just depends on what it is that you're trying to do as to which one makes sense. All right, question number 23, what does this return? So what's being asked here is casting. 
So what's going on here on this line is that we're casting from one type to another. A cast simply means you put in parentheses the type that you wish to make the variable look like. And for that one line and that one line only, it will make the variable look like another type. So here we have a float 54.2 and we're casting that float to a character. Okay, so that's interesting, but it will actually work. Both languages will let you do this. And again, it's because characters are really just numbers. So in actuality, what's going to happen here is the float will first be converted to an integer. An integer would make it into 54, because if you take a float and you cast it to an integer, it just drops everything after the period. So 54.2 becomes 54. 54.99999 becomes 54. It doesn't care. It always drops everything after the period. And then to convert that into a character, it's simply going to convert the ASCII or um, the integer value 54 into a character. And so if we were to look at an ASCII table, and certainly you would not be expected to memorize this or anything like that, but if we were to look at an ASCII table, we will see that 54, I think, comes out to the number six on the keyboard. And so in actuality, this would print out the number six as a character. Um, and let's see if that is true. I think that's what it is. Uh, we're just going to blow this up a little bit. Yeah, there it is. So 54 is actually the number six. And again, I've alluded to this before, but I just want to uh, show you this. This is the ASCII table, which shows all of the different values for the characters. So the number, the letter A is actually 65. The letter B is 66. The letter C is 67. That's the capital letters. And then over on the lowercase side, lowercase A is 97, lowercase B is 98. So again, when you store something as a character, really it's just remembering a number. And that's because computers, obviously they're storing everything in binary. So numbers are trivial, but characters, well, they had to do something to convert them. So that's how that works. All right, so that brings us to question number 24. Where is 00 in a graphical window? And the answer is right up in here. In the top left corner of the window is where you are in 00. So in all GUIs, 00, top left corner. Question 25, what color is represented by 0000 FF? So if you remember the brief discussion about colors, they're stored in hexadecimal values and a number from 0 to 255. And so 0, 0 means nothing. So there are three parts to a color in light. It's red, green, blue, RGB. And so red is 0, which means there's no red. Green is 0, which means there's no green. Blue is FF, which means that it is all blue. So this would come out to blue. The only thing you need to remember here is RGB. Um, that's as much as we would ever ask you is which of these represents red, which is green, and which is blue. All right. Number 26, when does an event happen in a GUI? And the answer is only when the user does something. So in this interface that I'm working in, I just fired an event by simply highlighting that. I fired an event by bolding that. I fired an event by unbolding that. Each time I interact with the GUI in any way, I'm firing events. And then the event has an event handler that says like on button press or on mouse down or whatever it is that then makes something actually happen in the code. So events only happen when the user does something in the interface. Question seven, 27. What is the advantage of a linked list over an array list or a list? Okay, so the short version of this story is that array lists and lists work like arrays, but they get bigger every time that they need to add in a number and they have exceeded their size. So array lists and lists start off as either 10 or 16 uh, characters, uh, an array of 10 or 16 cells, depending on the language. And when you add in the 11th or 17th thing, it doubles the size of the array list or list. And then it now is 20 or 32 in size. And that was just to hold 17. So the downside of an array list or a list is that yes, it does grow as you need it, but it grows in this weird way where it doubles in size or it grows significantly in size as you add items in there. And so to store 17 things in one that started off as a size 16, you actually end up using up 32 blocks of memory, which is not great, but it's especially worse when you get to a million and you need to add in one more thing and it has to double to 2 million. So the size of an array list or a list, it certainly grows as you add things in, but it grows in this kind of clunky way. 
And the reason they do that is because it's very, very difficult. It's a lot of work to copy all the cells out of the old array into the new array, because it actually has to make a whole new array, copy everything down from the old array, and then allow you to do your ad. They don't want to have to do that every single time you do an ad, so they grow by more in order to make it seem like it's working really well. So the main downside of an array list or a list is that while it is growing dynamically, it grows dynamically in a way such that you're getting blocks of extra space, and it is not always reflective of the actual number of things you want to store in there. Whereas with a linked list, it only adds exactly as much space as is needed in order to store the item that you're trying to store. So linked lists just store things more efficiently. Other fun fact about array lists and lists is that they never shrink. If you add 1 million items to an array list and then delete 1 million items, it's still of size 1 million. It never actually shrinks unless you specifically call a method to cause it to do that, which there's a capacity method in both array lists and lists that allow you to forcefully change the size, but it doesn't do it automatically. Whereas with a linked list, you delete something out, it is inherently one smaller. So the main advantage of a linked list over an array list or a list is that it is exactly the size that it needs to be at all times. All right, 28A. There's an A, B, C, and D here. 28A, true or false, it will take the same amount of time to find a random item in an array as it will in a linked list. Okay, so to be clear, we're picturing that an array just has random values in it. They're not sorted, they're just in there. And I ask you, is this number in the array? Well, let's talk about how you do that. You'd have to take the array and you'd have to go to the first cell of the array. I've lost my, uh, where are we? There we go. So we have an array and it's got a bunch of cells and each of those cells has numbers in it. And the question is, is the number eight anywhere in that array? Well, in order to do that, I have to look in cell zero and say, is that an eight? No, 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 is that an eight? No. And so the answer is no, eight is not in there. And how much time did it take me to do that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I had to do eight operations to tell you that the number eight was not in there. If the array had one million cells, I would have to do one million operations. So depending on the size of the array, that's how much work I'm going to have to do to answer your question, is something in there? So it is said that searching an unordered array is considered to be order n work because I decide depending on the size of the array I'm going to have to do n items of work. All right so let's change this picture to a linked list. So then the question is and I'll just do four in here one seven two five okay is the number eight in there how do I figure that out well I start off with head and I look at heads.data and it's not the number that I'm looking for so I move a current over to um, the next one, and I check if current.data is what I'm looking for, it's not. So I move that over and I check if current.data is the one I'm looking for, it's not. So I move that over. And again, it took me four operations because there were four items in the list. If there's a million operations, it's going to take me a million. And so searching for an item in an unordered linked list is order n. So the question is, is there any difference between searching for an item in an unordered linked list and an unordered array? And the answer is, no, there's no difference. They will take the same amount of time. So this is true. It is the same amount of time to find an item in a linked list as it is in an array. There's no benefit to it being an array. Okay, so now let's talk about 28B. What if both the array and the linked list are sorted? Okay, so if we start off with an array and we presume that that array is sorted, And I ask you, is the number six in that array? Well, you can certainly do the same thing that we did before, which is to check each cell one at a time down the row. That's what's called a linear search. But there was an optimization that we've talked about in 1321, which is called a binary search. And in a binary search, what we do is we pick the middle of the array, which I grant you this is an even number, so I could either choose this one or this one. Doesn't really matter. I'm going to pick the seven, and I'm going to say, take a look in that cell. The number that we were looking for is the number six. Is that cell six? The answer is no, it's not. 
is six greater than or less than that cell? And the answer is six is less than that cell. So I now know that six is not there. Because it's sorted, I can throw away half of the array. So now I go back again to the middle of the array, which we'll say is here. And again, I ask the same question, is where I'm now looking, the middle of the array, equal to six? Well, it is not. So I'm going to throw away the half of the array that is less than that, because we know six is greater than the number we looked at. That leaves me with here, and that's not equal to six. I can definitively now tell you that six is not in that array. And how much work did I have to do? Three items, despite the fact that this array has eight cells in it. So the amount of work that I had to do here is called log n, because each time I made a decision, I got to throw away half of the data, and that's a logarithmic explanation. So effectively, what's going on here is I'm able to go through this array in log n time. So it is much faster for me to find an item in an array that is already sorted. Let's take a look at the linked list equivalent of that. So we still have our head and we have our information along here and we have our null at the end, hopefully. All right, and what did I have in here? I had one, two, three, five, seven. All right, we're gonna stop here. So the question is, if I want to know is the number four in this linked list, can I perform a binary search here? Well, this was my head and I create my current or my temp or whatever it is. How do I get to the middle of this linked list? Well, in an array, I can simply take the size of the array, which in this case was eight. I can divide that by two and that tells me that cell four is the middle of the array. And then I can immediately look and see what's in cell four. But here, how do I immediately look and see what's in cell two? There's no syntax for that. I can't just say magically go to cell two of the linked list. The only way to get to cell two is to start a loop and keep moving current down until I get to the appropriate place. And for two items, yeah, that's two, that's not so bad. But for a million items, I'm going to have to move the current 500,000 times. I'm going to have to do n over two work just to find the middle. Now that I've found the middle, I can check and see, is that the number that I'm looking for? And if it's not, I can throw away half the list. But then to find the middle of the next block, I'm going to have to do n over two over two work, right? Because it's half of the remaining list and so on and so forth. And each time I make these decisions, I have to add these blocks together. Well, the way that big O works is if you, if you ask me, what is the big O of n over two? The answer to that is just n because it doesn't matter the two, it just kind of gets thrown away. All constants in big O notation just get thrown away. If you know something is actually four operations, it's just one. We throw away the constant four. If we know that something is two n, we throw away the two and say it's just n. And likewise, if it's n over two, we throw away the two and say it's just n. We're looking at the scale of it. We're not looking at the exact number of operations. We're just looking at the scale because it's useful to compare algorithms that are n versus n squared versus n cubed, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So the work to find something in here is actually said to be order n. Okay, so let's review. If I want to find something in an unordered linked list, it was order n. If I want to find something in an ordered linked list, it's still order n, it didn't actually get any better. But when I was in an ordered array, I could suddenly get it down to log n in an unordered array, it was n. So to be clear, back on our pick, our question, if both the array and the linked list are sorted, does that change the answer? And the answer is yes, it does change the answer. It makes the array faster, but it doesn't do anything for the linked list. So it is no longer the same amount of time to search an array and a linked list if they are both sorted. The array will be faster than the linked list. So. Let's talk about these two questions, to, or these three questions together. Linked lists use up exactly the right amount of space. That's why we use them. But they have a downside that you can't randomly access a particular cell in a linked list. The only way to get there is with n work. So searching something in a linked list is not really great. It actually is worse than searching for something in an array, assuming that the array is sorted. So you have a trade-off. 
putting data into an array is troubling. Putting data into a linked list is very easy. Searching for data in a linked list, quite difficult. Searching for data in an array, very easy. Why did I say that inserting data into a array is troubling? Well, let's assume that I have an array and it's already sorted. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13. And I want you to insert the number 8. Well, where does it go? It, it's supposed to go here, but there isn't a place there. So my only option is to grow the array, move that over, move that over, move that over, and put the 8 in here. Now I have accomplished what I needed to do, but look at how much work I had to do. I had to do n over 2 work, which is just order n. So inserting into an array is order n. Now let's do that same thing with a linked list. So we had a 1, and we had a 3, and we had a 5, and we had a 7, and we had a 9, and an 11. And I want to insert an 8. I make a new node. I put the 8 in it. I set the next to there and I update this one link and bada boom, I have inserted it in here. How much work was that? Well, I did have to find the right place to insert it. So ironically, the search took N to get to the right place. And then there was one operation in order to put it in there. But if I always put it in at the beginning of a link list, it's always order one. If I always put it in at the end of a linked list and I have a tail, then it's always order one. So putting into the front or back of a linked list, trivial. Putting into the middle of a linked list, that's a lot of work. And there's no good benefit for sorting it, so why are you doing this? So it seems like there's pros and cons to each of these structures, which is why they all exist. Link lists are very efficient in space. They're very easy to add to the front or the back. They kind of suck at putting things in the middle, and they kind of suck at searching. Arrays, on the other hand, are not very efficient. Array lists or lists are not very efficient when it comes to space, but they do have the advantage that you can individually access an individual cell, which means that you can decide whether an individual cell has the value that you're looking for in it, and you can do binary searches. So inserts kind of suck, especially if you're putting them in the middle. Searches much faster. So pros and cons. All right, so that brings us back to question number 28C. Is it faster to get an item out of a binary search tree or a sorted array? And the answer to that question is it's the same. You can perform a binary search on an array, that's what we just talked about, or an array list. You can also do a binary search on a binary search tree. It's why it's called a binary search tree, because you are able to always do a binary search. As a quick reminder, a binary search tree is where you have nodes that each have two children underneath them, a left and a right. And so in the case of a binary search tree, you're going to have a root, and then you're going to have a node, and it's going to have a left and a right. And each of those then can have nodes with left and rights, and each of those can have nodes with left and rights, and so on and so forth. And the advantage of a binary search tree is that as you add items in, if it is smaller than the item that you're currently looking at, you go left. If it's smaller than the item you're currently looking at, you go left. If it's greater than the item you're looking at, if I try to put in four, it's less than a five, so I go left. It's greater than a three, so I go right, and that's where the four goes. If I get to put in a seven, it's gonna go here because it's greater than a five. If I put in nine, it's gonna go here because it's greater than the five and then greater than the seven. If I put in six, it's greater than the five, but less than the seven, and it goes down here. So the advantage of this is if I ask you, is six in here? You just have to look in three places. You look here, you look here, and you look here, and you know where it is. And again, this is said to be order log n to search the binary search tree. Inserting is order log n. Removing, order log n. Searching, order log n. No matter what you do with the binary search tree, it's always log n. And so this has the advantage over the array that it takes up exactly the amount of room it's supposed to have. Inserts are faster. Uh, I'm assuming that you want to keep it ordered. Um, removes are faster, assuming you want to keep it ordered. And searches are faster because they're inherently ordered. So 28C, is it faster to get an item out of a binary search tree or a sorted array? The answer is they're the same. All right, question 28D, which is faster to insert into? So inserting into an unsorted array, 
you can always put it at the very end of the array. Inserting into a sorted array, you're going to have to shuffle some amount of the array, so that's going to take more time. Inserting into an unsorted linked list, you can always put it at the front or the back, and in either of those cases, it's order one, assuming you have a tail pointer for the back. Inserting into a sorted linked list, that's going to be a whole bunch of time because you got to find where to put it, which is going to be n, and then you're going to do the insert. So a is going to be order one, b is going to be n, c is going to be one, d is going to be n, and e is going to be log n. And that's simply because binary search trees are better in that way. So the fastest thing to insert into is an unsorted array or an unsorted linked list. The next fastest thing to insert into is a binary search tree, and the slowest things to insert into are sorted arrays and sorted linked lists. All right, and then finally, question number 29. Given the following linked list, what is the value of head.next.next.data? All right, so head is this arrow. Head.next is this arrow. Head.next.next is this arrow. Head.next.next.data is 77. Okay, so just make sure you know how to trace your way through a linked list or a binary search tree or anything of that nature. Okay, so that completes the review of test number three. Um, if you understood everything in here, you're probably pretty good to go on the test. Remember that there is in the detail shell also the list of all of the topics. It's always worthwhile to go through all of those and also look at the previous quizzes that you have already answered because they also have questions that are similar. Take a look back on the test review for test one and test three. But honestly, if everything that I just went through went made if everything that I just went through made sense to you, then you're probably in really good shape for the test to uh, whenever you're taking it. And so I wish you the best on this test and all of your other tests. And we will see you soon. Bye.